My name is Carol Chomsky, and I am here uh, today, December 27th, 2017, with Professor Martha Shamalis of the Ohio State University Law School um, to interview her as part of the Section on Women in Legal Education Oral History Project um, for the Association of American Law Schools. So, Hi, Carol. Hi, <laughs> <I'm> Martha. <laughs> it's so great to see you in this setting. It's wonderful to be here, and I'm really excited to be able to talk with you about more of your history. Um, so um, why don't you start out talking a little bit about your family and early education. We'll get to law school eventually, but we, we need to get there. <laughs> so I grew up in Watertown, Massachusetts. And um, I have one sister, and um, both of us were the first in our family to go to college. Um, I went to Tufts University, um, and my sister went to Simmons. So even though I lived away from home, which was a very big deal, um, I was still pretty close to where I grew up. And did you always know you would end up at least at college, if not law school? So my parents um, always really urged us to go to college. I think it had been um, an aspiration, particularly of my father, to um, have gone to college and he didn't have the opportunity to do so. And also, um, he often mentioned that he wished he had been a lawyer. Um, he died when I was 14, and I think that that probably made a difference in my choices. But um, beyond going to college, there wasn't anything specific. Mm -hmm. And what did, uh, what did your parents, what did your father do? Um, my father was a um, cook and a diner. Um, my father's family is Greek. And so um, his family owned uh, the classic Greek diner um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, it was a really difficult way of making a living. I can remember him getting up at 4 o'clock a.m. in the morning so that he could be there when the diner opened. Um, and, but there was always a lot of good food. Um, <laughs> Uh, my mother um, worked as a clerk in an insurance agency. Um, so we were um, a working class family. We rented an apartment uh, for most of my life. And like a lot of Americans, I thought of myself as middle class until I went to college. <laughs> and uh, why Tufts? I mean, you said it was you know, somewhat close to home, but is that... What? I think that was part of it. Um, I also got a full scholarship uh, to mm -hmm. attend Tufts. And as I've been thinking about it, um, my law school, my college education um, was pretty much paid for. This was uh, during the Great Society. So um, I had Office of Economic Opportunity loans because I was a low-income student. I had a full tuition scholarship uh, by a donor at Tufts. Uh, by the time I went to college, uh, because my father had died, I had, my mother had Social Security benefits um, for, uh, on behalf of her children. And um, so that combination, that financial package, allowed me to have what I now see was a very expensive education um, with very few student loans. Mm -hmm. And did you, did that shape, I mean we, we can come back to that later, but, but did that shape your aspirations or your, your life in some way coming from that? And I, I mean did you understand then how much support you were getting or did that come later? Um, it came a little bit later, although I was happy to have it. I think, like most young people, I thought, <laughs> I got good grades, of course I should have this. And um, what was much more influential in those college years, um, so I went to Tufts between 1967 and 1971. Mm -hmm. And as uh, many people know, that was during the Revolution. Uh, so the political activism was 
uh, on the part of college students was at its height. And that was, more than anything else, what colored my views about education, the law, and other uh, kinds of... Can you talk a little bit more about that, about that influence? Yes. Um, so I would say that, first of all, um, just in terms of spending um, my time on political activities, um, it was pretty interwoven with the curriculum at Tufts. We had something called the Experimental College that was in part taught by students. And I took uh, courses in women's liberation, um, which hadn't yet become part of a, a curriculum. There wasn't anything like women's studies or gender studies at that point. Um, I also remember uh, enrolling in a kind of ed what we would call now experiential education course, uh, welfare rights organizing, which meant that I went into Boston and I worked with the National Welfare Rights Organization, which was a real, uh, really at that point influential um, uh, organization that advocated on behalf of people on federal assistance, a kind of poverty. Um, organization um, and learn a little bit about community organizing from that. Mm -hmm. So um, the other courses I took, I was a sociology major, I remember taking a course on um, on Marxism, uh, contemporary uh, uh, practice of Marxism in both Russia and China. Uh, so this was it, it was interwoven. And, and did, you, did you pick that direction, or did it sort of just flow out of things that interested you in terms of the, the course selections? I mean, did you, did you go in with a political perspective and effectuate it there, or did you go in, as many young people do, just, here I am at college, and then, and then those So I went in with inclination. Um, I definitely was a Democrat. <laughs> I um, was thought of myself as civil rights minded, although in my high school I believe there were no black students at Watertown mm -hmm. High School. So the sort of racial integration was more of this um, notion on the part of someone from Boston that this is the way they are as opposed to having been mm -hmm. a lived experience. So. I, I think I had those affiliations, but it was really the early days um, and choosing of my friends um, in, in college. And I have to say that the Students for a Democratic Society, there were uh, a number of very active student organizations, and I immediately got involved with them, engaged in various types of political actions on their part, and then it becomes part of your identity mm -hmm. without really knowing that there was a point where you chose. But of course I did, because not everyone, by any means, was political. There were, um, I remember thinking that there were some students who were very traditional. There were some students who I would call more counterculture types at that time, uh, that, that might have gravitated more towards the environment than um, and and uh, even educational reform was that issue, and then mm -hmm. there are the more political types that um, I, I sort of fell in with. And did you have um, women faculty? Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> and that, you know, and this was so important. Uh, two women in particular, uh, both who, whom had were deans, at what was then Jackson College, because mm -hmm. Tufts was not totally gender integrated. Tony Shays, um, uh, who uh, was a lawyer and uh, uh, a, a sort of an amazing um, uh, advocate for women's inter mm -hmm. in, uh, interests, and Adele Simmons, who later became um, the head of the MacArthur Foundation, who was also um, she's a scholar of, of, uh, of Africa, but uh, very much promoted 
women and women's interests and, and taught one of these courses that was geared towards um, women's liberation. And, and what kind of impact did they have on you? Um, they and there were a couple of other female professors. I would just say a profound impact. Again, I kind of took it for granted a little that there would be these highly accomplished women that would be um, already have kind of risen to the top. Um, you know, I didn't realize at that point that maybe each of them had, had faced some barriers. Tony Shays was in, ended up by being Secretary of the Army at one point, and she's another mm -hmm. first. Um, um, but there was this, um, I think, belief that um, it was not only appropriate, but very important for young women to be a part of change. Um, and at least looking back, this may not have been true, but this is the narrative I tell. <laughs> we weren't too much interested in what jobs we would have. Mm -hmm. It was thought that it was much more what impact we would have. So. Um, that to me in itself is sort of empowering, that, that uh, there, at least at that moment there wasn't a concern and for someone who had not come from a family that was financially secure, it was amazing that I felt that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and did that, how, how did that interact with your family? I mean, your political activity in college and then this a, sort of There focus. was a little tension there. <laughs> Um, I think my mother wanted me to be a teacher. I know she did, and she kind of thought maybe I would get my teaching certificate mm -hmm. and have a, uh, so she was a little nervous when I started not talking about those kinds of things. Um, but generally, I never had a falling out with anyone in my family, and they've always been um, now that I look back, amazingly tolerant of any strangeness on the part of their children or nieces and nephews, just a kind of uh, warm, mm -hmm. supportive uh, group. So there were uh, the, the normal tensions, I would say, you know, are you smoking marijuana or, uh, or what's the deal with this guy, are you seeing this boyfriend? But Beyond that, not to. And of course, much. you ultimately became a teacher, although maybe not the kind of teacher. I know, that I know, that's right. I think my yeah. mother was very happy that I became yeah. a teacher and yeah. she was happy that I got tenure and all that. <laughs> yes. So, um, what did you think in college? You talked about not having a particular job in mind, but did you have a vision during college of what you? were going to do? Was law school part of that? You talked about your father wanting you to be a lawyer. Were you thinking so law So the law school um, aspiration didn't come until later. I, I think one of the big, the important experiences I had in college is I've, I was part of a group, um, we called ourselves FOCUS, Fellowship of Concerned University Students. Um, and uh, the mission of FOCUS was to recruit minority students from high schools all across the country and place them um, in colleges. So this was, a, this was a strange moment, a wonderful moment in history, where universities realized that they had this money from the federal government, uh, Office of Economic Opportunity that they could use as scholarships for students, but they had not yet built their network to find those students. So um, um, we were a group of students um, organized primarily by a few people, a few students from Harvard, and, and then expanding out to other uh, universities in the Boston area that had grants from the Ford Foundation, um, the Rockefeller Foundation, and other money. So what we did is, uh, for two summers, um, I spent the summer uh, going to various 
upward bound programs. Mm -hmm. These are programs for high school mm -hmm. students, minority high school students, low income high school students in Appalachia. And we would, we would kind of find the students we thought would really do well in college, even though they hadn't yet got the test scores. Or, mm -hmm. um, and then the other part of our job was going to universities, going to these admissions offices and saying, how many places are you going to give us? And so amazingly enough, they would say, I have five slots for you. And so that to me was, you know, and we had like a big meeting in Nashville, Tennessee, we would meet, um, where we matched the students with the colleges. And I have to say that we, we placed more students, we placed hundreds of students in that program, much, many more than a lot of the kinds of um, uh, opportunity programs I've been associated with since mm -hmm. because of the availability of the federal funds. So that really impressed me. I also spent a lot of time in Louisiana. I ended up by uh, marrying someone from Louisiana, <laughs> moving down there, you know, just kind of finding myself in a different uh, part of the country, and then thinking, okay, now what do I do? And uh, things were a little harder from then. There wasn't a whole lot of federal money that was just coming, you know, to uh, say what was the next um, social action you wanted to engage in. Mm -hmm. And and so this was during well the the focus work, work on focus was summers. You said during. College. During college. Yes, and we had a rule that you couldn't be in focus unless you were an undergraduate. That we didn't, literally, not only do we not trust anyone over 30, we didn't trust anyone outside of college. So all of this organization was run by these 20-somethings. And then you, but yeah, and then after, so you graduated college mm. in 71. 71. And you took, you were out of school for a little bit of Just time. a year. Um, I moved to Louisiana, uh, tried to find a job that was very hard. Mm -hmm. um, I worked in a doctor's office, knew I had to get out of there fast. <laughs> it was not my calling. Um, and that's when I entered LSU Law School. Okay, so, so and, I was and there and I went to the law school where I was living. And did you... So, so you didn't leave college thinking law school was... No, in your future. Not, it, not really. I mean, I, it was in the back of my mind, but I wasn't planning on it. I just didn't know what, what would happen. And then mm -hmm. when I was, I was in Baton Rouge and thought, well, this seems like something that would be good for me. And your then husband w w was supportive of that? Yes. Yes, yeah. he was. He's, he um, was a journalist in the area. Um, and uh, he also taught at Southern University um, for a while, taught journalism at Southern University. So it kind of fit. So 72, so 72 to 75, you're in law school. I am. And that's at the very early end, I think, of the beginning of the expansion of numbers of women. Absolutely, and almost to the date. <laughs> And this is why I think of myself, timing is everything. Yeah. And this, this was very important because prior to my class, there had been pretty much a smattering of women. And sometimes you'd have like one or two a year or five. And we're talking uh, first year classes at LSU of, of, of 350 big classes. Mm -hmm. This was sort of an open admissions kind of situation. In my year, there were more than 20 of us, but that was a really big year, and I think it might have been even the first time it mm -hmm. happened. So we were tight, the 20 of us. Yeah, that's still a small. Oh, it was small. Of the class. Yes, yes. Yeah. We we knew each other. We were we were very different ideologically. Uh, you could imagine how different I was from some of my classmates because this is prim primarily a state school. Mm -hmm. Most everyone had gone to Louisiana. They were uh, the um, left wing political winds had not hit there in the same way. But we realized that that uh, um, that there was something. 
distinctive about being a woman law student. And so, uh, at least for a while, it was kind of a nice uh, group. And we did lots of things that I laugh at and think are funny. Like, we didn't sit together. We decided where we were going to sit. We made outlines together. We decided that we would, if somebody said something, we would say something supportive of them. Um, and we formed and we formed the Women's Law Society. So we did okay. So what was the reception like? I mean you said if somebody said something you would be, you meant if some if one of the women spoke in class someone else would say. But did you face what kinds of reaction was there from the ma overwhelmingly male student body? Yes. So um it was really, it depended on the man, because certainly there were real allies and wonderful classmates, uh, but there were, there was some hostility. And, um, and I think it was the usual mixture of hostility uh, based on gender, but based on other types of differences, and certainly we were, we were re in a real minority. Uh, what we felt was the bigger challenge was not the male classmates, but the male professors. So the dynamic was a little mm -hmm. different. There was only one woman professor when I went mm -hmm. to LSU, and, and she is Catherine thing? Spate, <laughs> who had been there for all of one year. Oh. So she taught family law. Um, and uh, and she, she and I maybe have diametrically opposed political views, but she was my great supporter from day one. And, you know, this is why I always um, think this is kind of, you know, I have, I have good feelings. As you can tell, I have pretty good feelings about LSU, despite the very different climate it was. But there were some male professors there that were um, skeptical about women even being lawyers, or particularly skeptical, you know, this was still the time of when the ERA, whether the ERA uh, should have passed or, you know, it should be um, part of the law. And there were many of the male professors who thought that women's place was in the home and this would be a terrible thing. Uh, so that's what we faced. It was more this sort of um, the, the thinking about the law itself because 72 to 75, all we had was read versus read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Minimum scrutiny with bite maybe. And so um, in my constitutional law class, we spent oh, not even a day on gender classifications. And um, it was all, well, women are different, and so hence the different treatment of sex discrimination versus other suspect classifications. Um, the family law of Louisiana, the um, man was still considered the headmaster of the family under the community property regime. So it was how do you deal with professors and a substantive body of law that thought of your group as explicitly inferior. And that did was the challenge. Did that come out in the class, in classroom discussions? I mean, was it, was it, did it surface or was it sort of internal dealing with? Well, it, it was of course both. I remember one class where, and I can't even recall what the, and I liked the uh, professor very much, a young man, but he said, oh, now I do remember, he said something about how women always change their minds. Um, they don't know their minds, they always, women always change their mind, and I hissed. <laughs> because at Tufts, if you didn't like something, you could hiss. And I realized, that you were not in tough sense. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the late mm -hmm. '60s anymore either. Um, and I remember going to see him after and talking about it. And 
uh, and then realizing that this was going to have to be a little bit different way of negotiating. Um, and also, you know, sort of learning to speak one's objections as opposed mm -hmm. to kissing. Um, sometimes we just w went along to get along. There's a notorious family law professor who believed in the natural differences of men and women. And I remember studying for that exam with the other women and basically kind of preparing how we would uh, write, uh, you know, sort of, I think about it as kind of with a slave mentality. <laughs> and then we would say, of course the ERA will undermine the fundamental structure of, and, and uh, you know, how to secure an A in that course. So, the, yes, <laughs> there were some differences. I um, went back to LSU um, to give a talk, and, um, and apparently there was some document that, they, that the faculty had kept, because at that point uh, the faculty had to approve if you were um, an officer of the Law Review, and I was, became editor-in-chief. And they, um, it was written, despite her women lib tendencies, <laughs> we think Martha is able to do the job. And so, I mean, it was like right there explicitly um, in the record. Yeah, that's, and, and then you said um, Catherine Spate was a great supporter Mentor? I mean, how did you? How Not did really. That she was itself? just um, someone who I think quietly behind the scenes always advocated for me, and I never knew this until later. Mm -hmm. I actually had some wonderful mentors at LSU, male professors, who um, who took me under their wing because I had performed very well in the class, and were clearly thinking about it would be nice to add women to the faculty. You know because there was only one. And so it was really a very different time. And when I got very good grades and people saw that they thought I had the intellect to do this sort of work, um, this was the time when at LSU they didn't mind hiring their own. The dean talked to me when I was a second year student and asked whether I'd consider thinking about being a law professor. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the interesting maybe paradoxes, but I don't really think of it as a paradox, was despite the fact that I went to a school that was uh, pretty hostile to feminism, um, because of the timing and because of personal um, support, I probably um, got a boost to my career that I don't know that I would have gotten so easily at other places. So, at other places, other law and, schools, and, yeah. and, maybe, and maybe other times too. Oh, but certainly other yeah, times. Yeah, no yeah, timing yeah. is yeah. the key thing. Yeah. So, what did you? So, so even as a second year student, I have to say you mm -hmm. underplayed your. You you got very good grades, but but you were at the top of the class like all three years. I, think. I was, so. <laughs> I was, and I, I had the highest average, and the highest average ever, you know, they tried to figure out if someone had that. I did really well. Yes. In the, the, for, the, for the exams, I yeah. did yeah. really well, yes. So uh, even second year, the, you said the professor or the dean, the dean talked yeah. to you about maybe uh, becoming a law, a law professor. Did you... Did you think about that? Is that what your plan was? Well, it's, I started to formulate, that sounds like a yeah. good plan. No. So, um, although I didn't, again, when I think about how intentional people are now and how elaborate the hiring process is, um, what I did was think, well, I should get a clerkship. I should mm -hmm. have a federal clerkship, and I really want one. And I interviewed at two places. For after the clerkship for law teaching uh, jobs, LSU and Tulane. And when LSU made me the offer, I took it like I kind of knew I would. Mm -hmm. And that was even before the, that was during the clerkship or before you had No, uh, it was after. 
or a clerkship. You know, in those days, it wasn't was kind it of yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it probably was, you know, very much towards the end of the clerkship. Yeah. yeah. So talk a little bit about the clerking experience, and in, both in terms of just what it what it meant to you, and then in in terms of there's the intellectual development, and but also the you know again where there are women other women clerks around um, the gender dynamics of the court. Yes. So I clerked for Judge Charles Clark on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in Jackson, Mississippi. And um, Judge Clark um, had uh, been a Republican appointee. Um, he uh, had made his reputation representing the state of Mississippi in some of the segregation battles. So he, he was thought of as a conservative Republican, which he was. Um, an extraordinary man, he decided that it would be good for him to hire liberal clerks. So the three of us, uh, two um, uh, male law clerks and myself, all had very liberal political views. Um, and I think I might have been only the second woman that Judge Clark had ever hired. There was one other woman. Uh, so there weren't many. This mm -hmm. was, again, the sort of first or second. Um, it was a, an absolutely great experience, and primarily because of the professionalism and kindness of the judge. Um, he, he ran a very... Um, organized operation. You know, we we got there uh, every day at the same time. Mm -hmm. He made sure that we didn't do any busy work or we weren't getting laundry or doing these other personal services. We were writing opinions. We were briefing, writing memorandum. We, he treated us as professionals. He, um, every day at 10 o'clock, we would meet for coffee, meet the four of us for coffee um, and discuss the cases, so it was kind of like a high-level seminar. Um, I loved the oral arguments in New Orleans. Um, and I, I have to say that um, I just learned so much about the law uh, from him and, and, and felt like his opinions, even though I might have wished some of them had gone the other way, were grounded, and he was um, someone who placed a high value on collegiality. So um, it was a, a great experience. The, um, the first case that I remember coming across my desk was, um, and it was just do, do, it was like, should we have another rehearing on Bank, or there was some kind of procedural motion. And it was the Teamsters case, the, the, you know, the huge Title VII case that uh, pretty much changed and, and, and established the law of race discrimination. And I remember going to the judge and saying, I don't know, but I think this is really important. <laughs> and he was very kind and said, yes, I think this is going to be important, Martha. And uh, we went, kind of went from there. Mm -hmm. So, and from, from that experience, during or at the end of the clerkship, mm -hmm. you ended up interviewing for teaching jobs. So yeah. you were thinking more seriously about teaching, mm -hmm. and you ended up back at LSU. Yes. And so what was that like? The place with still very, were you a, the second? Woman? I was absolutely the, the second. second woman. Catherine and I, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, and so um, my teaching uh, experience at LSU was a pretty interesting one. Um, I did have the experience that I think if anyone teaches at the law school that they went to, it's a little hard to make the transition. Um, but it was okay. You know, I, I sort of kept my mentors. 
And I noticed when I got to faculty meetings that some of the professors that I admired very much uh, didn't so much admire their behavior in faculty mm -hmm. meetings. So <laughs> the, the sort of realignment yeah, yeah, yeah. is now, now had to take place. And that's very hard when you're someone who's been the pet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so I would say that uh, years later I, I um, studied Rosabeth Moss Cantor, Women in the Corporation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, she had done this classic study on tokenism. So, um, uh, and often uh, women, when they are an extreme minority, are sort of assimilated to um, roles that they would have in the family. So there's like the little sister or the pad, and then there's the militant and, and the uh, iron maiden. Or, <laughs> and so clearly when I came, I was kind of the pet or the little sister. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered whether, you know, when that role started to erode, making the shift could be a little more difficult. But um, a couple of things that, again, were good and... and were similar to my law school experience. A few professors took me under their wing in terms of teaching. And so even though I was very young, um, you know, big classes with 80 plus students, and at that time we had four courses, and we kind of like had the courses assigned. <laughs> so uh, I, I've taught torts almost every year of my life, but I never said I want to teach torts. Yeah. Um, I wanted to teach criminal procedure in those days, and I, call, I taught torts, criminal procedures, I taught criminal procedure, I taught ad law, I taught civil procedure. You know, this was a different generation. Um, so there was enormous teaching burden. And, um, but, I, but I was able to find someone almost for each class who would say, here are my notes, let's talk it over. Um, so I, I the teaching piece was just fine for me. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have um, difficulty um, getting pretty good evaluations from students. And did the class, so you talked about the number of women, which took a little bump up when you were in law school. Now it's a couple of, it's after graduation, another year later. And so it's it, about the time that yes. some schools at least started to Right. really take a bigger jump up so so the, it, it it increased and I don't you know now I'm not even remembering but it was probably still under a third um, women law students when I was teaching but it had kind of bumped up to mm -hmm. a third um, it was never as high as other schools that got to 40 and 50 fast but I, I, I think I'm right about that so it was still a male dominated environment but not as intensively mm -hmm. male-dominated. And being one of still just two, at least mm -hmm. when you first got there, and maybe maybe it grew in, mm -hmm. in the time you were there, but women faculty, how did, how did that play out in terms of relationships with women students, and did you play, you know, how did... How yeah, I don't, you know, at this point, and, and my memory kind of is, <laughs> has faded, I don't remember having particular women students that I um, had close relationships mm -hmm. with. So it was very much the honorary man kind of thing. I remember I wore these pantsuits of the time, and if I spent time, it was with my friends who were all men younger mm -hmm. faculty and older faculty. Um, and so there was less of that. I did teach one course, you know, the closest I got to gender issues was teaching a course that was just called Civil Rights, um, that dealt with civil rights in employment, and housing, public accommodations. It was just a, the sort of Tommy Emerson book uh, type civil rights course. And we did a little bit of gender. And I still had a connection with the Women's Law Society. Uh, but 
in the the um, the one uh, because I wasn't at LSU for that long. The one um, contentious issue on the faculty had to do with hiring a African American woman on the faculty, and in those days, that was perceived as a racist for intersectionality. Mm -hmm. So I remember being on the side of wanting to hire her, um, having, uh, by the time I left LSU, I remember thinking maybe it was a good time to leave because I could just see that transition from uh, someone who was comfortable with my colleagues and I was on the executive committee of the faculty, I was an insider. I had gone to that school mm -hmm. and then I realized, oh, this is, this isn't going to be as smooth as it started out to be. So, can you, I don't, if you can talk a little bit more about that, about ten, tensions, about that that shift, or what it was like. Well, for you. yeah. Well, it, so you just realized that I realized that there were going to be issues. I can remember uh, the faculty wanting to know the or fa faculty members wanting to know this particular candidate's LSAT score. When they <laughs> never asked that mm -hmm. about the prior white candidates we had had. In my saying, I thought that that was race discriminatory. And having more of the conversation with Martha, you know, we have to be careful, you know, who we hire. Where, um, and so that was an issue. Um, I also very much tried to work with the admissions office and, and um, I can't remember who else, but I think the minority students to increase the number of minority students mm -hmm. at LSU. And although that was a little bit smoother in terms of getting the approbation of the administration, um, at that time there were precious few minority students mm -hmm. at LSU and um, it was really hard to encourage uh, black students to come to LSU and to kind of get the support that would be needed to have students feel comfortable coming mm -hmm. to LSU, particularly when they could go to Southern. So there were those kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. And then on gender, were you, when you left, you were there until 1981, I think? Well, um, yes, that probably is right. Did I had a, a, a couple of a couple leads. of other? Yes, yeah. I was going to ask about those too. But yeah. but were there other? Did that African American woman get hired? As it turned out, no. no. <laughs> and um, but I don't actually remember why. Whether she said no or we right. didn't. Yes. And what was there any more gender? I mean, were there more women there by the time you left or? Uh, and this is where I don't have the numbers. I yeah. just, at that point, it was, I think, the kind of plateauing. Mm -hmm. And so by the time I knew that I wanted to leave LSU, um, it was still an intensively male, and intensively white place yeah. that sort of changed somewhat, but not greatly, over a long period yeah. of time. So, um, and you started to mention, you had a few leaves doing other things while you were teaching. So you were teaching full time, but then you were at, you, you worked at a law firm, you worked at the Justice Department, right? I did. I worked so, for the Labor Department and I worked for a law firm. A Labor and, Department, that's yeah. right. Um, so partly this was my attempt to kind of make another move. So I worked for a large firm, because I had never practiced. Walt Harkrader in Ross, which was a great firm in mm -hmm. D.C., um, and that was a terrific experience. And at that time, there was so much legal work in D.C. that firms were just happy to have people that they thought could do the work of an associate mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and to come as long as you wanted. So I just took a leave and I worked as an associate in a Washington, D.C. practice. But at that time, not only did we do the sort of regular, did I do regulatory work, but I was involved in some interesting civil rights cases. So this is where mm -hmm. I really began to think, oh, I would like to be someone who was 
teaching or practicing in the civil rights area. You know, it hadn't quite gelled until that mm -hmm. point. Uh, there was a pro bono case against Uncle Ben's. It was a race discrimination case that we won a class action. We won a big class action against the federal government. Age discrimination sued. And I worked for a very uh, controversial partner, Terry Lenzer, Lenzner, who went on to be the Democrats' big opposition research person, um, mm. uh, suing the Boston Public Housing Authority for race discrimination. So that was, um, that was important to me because at least I, I, was, uh, I saw uh, the construction of these kinds of cases and, and got a little flavor for litigation. And that was, so that was at the law firm. Right. And then you were also in the Civil Rights Division at at the Labor Department. Labor Department. Yeah, so this is the... A little bit the, later. Yeah. yeah, this is the... Um, uh, the the department that um, enforces the executive order against discrimination and affirmative action. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had gender discrimination suits. By that time, it kind of had shifted to gender discrimination. Um, and particularly, I was involved in a, a large suit that um, against the uh, lumber mill in Montana that had uh, discriminated against women. So we you know, worked with expert witnesses and determining whether the uh, women were qualified to do the job and um, uh, had a taste of that type of mm -hmm. litigation. But during that period, remember I was still on leave, mm -hmm. during that period Ronald Reagan was elected. And my department was not going to be able to do the things that we wanted to do. So I got a, quickly got a job at Energy because they were um, mm -hmm. going to uh, represent uh, individuals, believe it or not, at Energy who had been affected by Agent Orange. I thought, oh, this will be interesting, doing this kind of administrative work. But when Reagan got into office, he um, got rid of all the Carter holdovers, mm -hmm. <laughs> that we were called. <laughs> so I lost my job. Oh. I was very happy. <laughs> because by that point, I had um, uh, uh, Peter Shane and I had gotten together, and we decided we would go on the market <laughs> together go again on the teaching market mm -hmm. together. So I was just happily ensconced in D.C. writing my article, <laughs> Title VII. No. So, so were you out of, so you, were you still on leave from LSU or you? Yes, I was, yes, I was on leave from LSU during this time. I okay. tried not, although I will now tell you that <laughs> when we got the jobs at Iowa, mm -hmm. um, I had to give up tenure in order to get my fancy job at Iowa. So you got tenure at I LSU. I did get tenure at so, LSU. So we, didn't, so we didn't talk about what you were writing and doing yes. at, at, then, because you, your, your civil rights commitments partly came through the leave positions, but maybe you brought that back in. To so the, the, the article I wrote, and at that time, uh, you could get tenure with only one article. At LSU, was more of a teaching institution, but um, was on tort law, hmm. um, and I um, was helped in that endeavor by the great, the late great Wex Malone, who was um, a legendary legal historian and legal realist. Um, so um, I wrote about tort law, and I um, had that article published in the Louisiana Law Review. Um, and again, just to show you how strange the world was then, and how informal and networky it was. It wasn't because I had taken a year's leave, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to go up for tenure when I had finished my article. Um, and I was told, I was kind of advised, oh yes, we would like you to come up for tenure because we want to give you tenure. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So again, I was yeah, spared yeah, right. that horrible <laughs> um, the uh, experience that most professors right. have. So I sort of received tenure from LSU, yeah. but. To get my fancy job at Iowa, I had yeah, to give, give that, it up. Give so you had to up. go through the process. I, and I did, again. and that and that was yes. the real thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and you were at Iowa for oh, thirteen what, years. Thirteen years. Yeah. Okay. So, so what was that? So, what was that like compared to? <laughs> I, it was very, very different. And um, I always think of Iowa as the years of the gender wars, and so. The interesting thing about Iowa is that um, there were still very few women law professors. Um, there may have, Josie Gittler was the woman before me, and there had been a, a, one other who had since left, and so again I was sort of like the, the second, second one. But th something ha was different at Iowa. And that is that there were there were a number of um, very strong, very important, in my view, clinical professors who were women. So they weren't on the tenure track, um, but there was a kind of critical mass of women faculty, even though it took a while before there were more women tenure track. Faculty, so um, many, many more female students, and so we were getting closer to the forty percent. Um, so the the one of the very big differences at, at Iowa was that there it was a much more scholarly faculty. It really was. Uh, different in that sense, in terms of expectations for scholarship. Um, there was a lot of hiring when I came in, so there was a big cadre of junior faculty. And we were both competitive and very supportive um, <laughs> with all that, what that brings. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a time when there was a lot of growth in terms of developing a kind of scholarly agenda. Um, there were many complaints at that time from students of sexual harassment, other types of uh, gender-related issues. Um, the dean, in my view, was sexist and protected faculty members and others who should have been held accountable for their actions, and he didn't mm -hmm. hold them accountable. Um, and uh, we had a number of very contentious, very, um, I would say, hurtful incidents at Iowa. So again, the irony was, you know, LSU was actually a much easier place for me to be mm -hmm. than Iowa. And how did the, so, so, so contentious issues, difficult moments, within the faculty so oh, yes that. yes it was so, and so so we I will tell you about the action because that's the way we called it um, and it could and there were a number of other but this was the what the incident most prominent in my mind that I think was most prominent in the minds of women faculty at that time so a faculty member was retiring and this particular faculty member was notorious for being sexist and racist and uh, not a good citizen. Uh, and uh, many attended the retirement dinner. I did not. Uh, but at the retirement dinner, the dean uh, was reading from some letter or document. And uh, to illustrate the humor of this retiring faculty member and recited a kind of notorious passage from Samuel Johnson who said, you know, a woman preacher is like a dog on its hind legs. You're not surprised, you know, you're, I, I can't even quite formulate it. I still kind of get a, a, 
uh, a block here, but uh, the gist of it is it's not su you're not surprised that they don't preach well, you're surprised they can do it at all. And there it was, right there with all the faculty and alumni, you know, this incredibly sexist mm -hmm. statement. And this was a year in which there had been complaints about sexual harassment. The dean had, you know, insisted that there wasn't enough evidence to go forward. There were, there's a lot that had brewed. So the women faculty got together, all but the first woman, all but Josie mm -hmm. Kittler, and decided we had to do something to protest this. Um, and by that time, there were more women on the faculty. Adrian Wing had joined the faculty. Mary du I think Mary Duzark was there. Um, and we decided that we would issue a statement about how this um, conduct on the part of the dean was intolerable. Um, and we decided to boycott graduation. And um, so we made this known. And boy, did hell break loose. I think rolling back, maybe I would have thought of some other action to engage in. But it was hard. It was that time yeah, of the yeah, year. Yeah. And it, we wanted something punchy. The students, many students were very angry at mm -hmm. us because they wanted us to be at graduation. The dean was stunned, I think. And, uh, and, and very hurt. Uh, it was hard. Mm -hmm. um, and many members of the faculty were very us. Um, and the various uh, local newspapers, the, De <laughs> the Des Moines Register and the Cedar Rapids <laughs> newspaper thought about, you know, they, they, they excoriated us for being, you know, basically these thoughtless, entitled women who would deprive um, students of our presence at graduation. So many things deteriorated after that. Um, eventually many of the faculty members, women faculty members who were part of that group left. left yeah. um, and then everyone. That when you, so you were there for 13 years? Sort of so that was I think in year, I can't actually remember probably seven or eight you know, or nine. So you had tenure, you were... Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, and maybe not all the women who spoke out had tenure at that yeah. point, but... Adrian so, did. Yeah, yeah. Adrian was the only one who said, you know, this is going to this is gonna be bad. And we said, ah, oh, it's not going to be that bad. Everyone will realize we're right. Yeah, I'm just... But, uh, yeah. yeah. And there were many of the clinical women who were on that. Mm -hmm. And they had they didn't have the same kind of right. protection for each other. Yeah. They yeah. didn't have some yeah. contractual security. And you know, I never felt like my job was uh, jeopardized, or and I did not feel that there was any individual retaliation. But it was it was tough. Yeah. Yeah. And they, and you know, it followed with the, the, this was a, in a series of these kinds of things. So did things change after? I mean, there's the the impact and the... Yes, the, things the, the, changed. <laughs> and it was so interesting because, you know, they, they change, but you wonder, you know, you sit there and say, well... So, um, so the, of course, the initial reaction, we were wrong, it was terrible, uh, everything was fine. Um, you know, this is a great place for gender, gender equality. Um, a couple of years, I think it was a year prior, someone had mentioned hiring Gene Love and Pat Kane, and the dean didn't like that at all, didn't think the scholarship was there, not the kind of person you want to hire laterally. After the action, oh, was there a change of heart? You know, and then I can't even tell whether, you know, how many years it was. Um, and, who knows, you know, all the factors that entered into mm -hmm. it, but one good change, but it didn't matter to us because it was still the same old place, 
was the recruiting of Gene Love and Peggy. Mm -hmm. um, we also had a situation where we issued a minority report about gender equality when the ALS committee mm -hmm. came. Um, so I think that there was, you know, the university was looking at it. it there was a tension paid and more women were hired. Um, but it is an interesting sort of thing. Um, to me, despite the great intellectual growth and the friendships, just couldn't wait to get, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I was ready to go. And, and before, I, I also um, decided to become much more involved in the women's studies program to sort of get myself out of law school. And this was a, a, a great decision yeah, on my Ray, part. You were chair I was a chair of the women's studies <laughs> program, yes. At the same time as being at the law school, this was... Yeah, this was yeah I had two yeah, offices, yeah, yeah. and this was, I always said, you did better with two deans. Because <laughs> yeah. you could say one, play one off against the other. Um, so I was a chair in the liberal arts college, and it was, it was mm -hmm. really... Uh, uh, a wonderful, yeah. difficult in, mm -hmm. in terms of not a lot of money, uh, hiring disputes as well. But um, but I learned a lot about interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary scholarship. Uh, made wonderful friends across the campus, mm -hmm. and edged myself away from the law school. So one thing that I've done. And it's kind of an interesting thing. I remember looking at my you know, computer, such as it was then, mm -hmm. and realizing that I hadn't sent a memo to the faculty, because we would often you know, mm -hmm. do it sort of for two years, when I had been very, very active, really active member of the university community and faculty. And I, I realized that what I did was this, this took a step aside from the law school, the law school. Yeah. yeah, and got much more immersed in the university and in... Yeah. And how did you, uh, it's, a, it's unusual, the interdisciplinary work is, it is and now more common, but, mm -hmm. but to be so engaged in another field at the university to end up chair of a department is a pretty big Big thing. So, how did you end up connecting there so that that? So, in, uh, the the connections were um, forged over a long period of time. I um, was uh, I collaborated uh, on an article with Linda Kerber, who is a very noted women's historian, and um, we became very close. We taught a, jointly taught a course in the law school. And Linda, even though she hadn't shared the Women's Studies program, was very connected to that program. So I had um, that personal connection with the program. And um, through Linda and others, um, we uh, the Women's Studies program had a feminist reading group that went on for eight years, and it was an interdisciplinary reading group. So before I became chair, I was very active in the feminist reading group. So now I know how Sally Kenny brought that. She brought that to the University of Minnesota later. The the interdisciplinary feminist reading. Group. I hired Sally. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Sally was the joint hire, yeah. and uh, with the Women's Studies program in political science. And, uh, and Linda, you know, was instrumental mm -hmm. with that. Um, so uh, I, I was pretty active in the program. And uh, being the chair is somewhat of a chore. Mm -hmm. So um, like a department head. Uh, so I think people were a little surprised when I said, I'll, I'd like to do it. And... Um, and for the reasons, you know, mm -hmm. that I, right. I I was involved with with that uh, with the program, 
And there were certain aspects of their program that were great for me. Like I realized that I hadn't really put together a speaker series before. And we have this wonderful interdisciplinary speaker series for years. And then the, the reading group, and then we did make uh, a joint hire. We had virtually no money. It was just so interesting because we didn't really even, you know, we didn't, it, we didn't really control the tenure line, even though we, because we were only a program, and uh, and I think I think our operating budget was four thousand dollars. I remember taking pencils from the law school <laughs> and other supplies, uh, but because universities always like to front us. Uh, there were, I mean, department chairs were always calling me up saying, you know, can we collaborate with this chair? Can we do this? Can we? So it was interesting having sort of the influence, <laughs> none of the money. Um, and we were very um, close to the university administration. So the one final political action that I was involved in through women's studies was the lawsuit of Jean Jew. Right, which you wrote about later as well. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, so what about happened? So, I got to know Jean Jew through um, the Committee on Status of Women, the university committee, and she had always been active, and she was a professor in the College of, an uh, associate professor in the College of Anatomy. Um, and uh, she was denied uh, promotion and uh, believed that it was the result of sexual discrimination and sexual harassment. And it had been of a very severe mm -hmm. nature. Um, comments made about her ethnicity, about her gender, um, rumors that she was having an affair with the chair of the department. It was a very bad kind of situation. Um, so she sued, and um, I thought that the university would attempt some kind of mediation or something. But as these things sometimes happen, they were very um, insistent that the denial be upheld. The university council took a very hard line in that case. It's interesting at the same time that they want to front the women's studies program and and look like they're behind it, they're doing that. You know. Yes, and there are, in the, the they are a lot of different right. people right. because, you know, I yeah. Hunter Rawlings was the president at that time, a really supportive person, but there were a lot of um, mm -hmm. actors so, in those this. Those lawyers, when the lawyers get yeah. Well, in the governor's office, uh -huh. you know, yeah. Terry Branstad, who's still around. Uh, so, so what happened was that, you know, Jean sued not only in federal court, um, but she also sued for defamation in state court. And, and we were very supportive. We went to the trial, various people. We had the Jean Jew Defense Committee, could have run out of women's studies. Um, and we thought when she prevailed in both courts that this would be the end. And the university said, no, we're appealing. All these racist and sexist things that were said were protected by the First Amendment. We were shocked. Again, why should I be? But we learned that, you know, that yes, they had that defense available, and uh, so they took it rather than, well, how could, we certainly wouldn't do this. Uh, so we kind of went into gear, and we, um, we took the judge's uh, decision, the district court's decision, and we mailed it to every faculty member on campus. You know, you just have university mail, you can kind of do this. With, with no statement, just mailed. This was a great opinion. And this time, sentiment was in our favor. Mm -hmm. And the various um, op-eds and editorials were, what's the, you know, what's the university doing? Why are they defending this? Uh, and the um, 
we were going to have a big rally one day, you know, in her favor after we had sent the opinion. We had like we had a big signatory thing, so we had hundreds and hundreds of faculty members signing on. And I remember the provost called me and said, uh, "We're dropping the suit." <laughs> so that was sort of. That was a big victory. deal. Yeah. Yeah. It was a victory. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, as you know, I wrote about it. And I'm sure people have various kinds of views uh, about this case because um, it was a difficult... Uh, the lines had been drawn in her department. Uh, it was a really um, divisive kind of thing. Mm -hmm. but. Jean had been so mistreated, and I just thought that at that point, there should come a time, and maybe we're at a time <laughs> where there's some accountability. Yeah. There's some accountability without, yeah. even before you win the federal no. No. suit, even before you win the state defamation. It's been a long time coming. But yeah, 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 well, yeah. and you know, we shall see, mm -hmm. but um, that was an important moment. For me, and as you can tell, though that's why I say the gender wars. Mm -hmm. um, and Jean Ju's case was really interesting because it was truly an intersectional case. It was about her being different mm -hmm. on a lot of grounds, and and she was somebody who had not been a feminist. You know, kind of the uh, she was just all science all the time. <laughs> And uh, and even when we were constructing various aspects, she was always so careful to make sure that we never overstated anything. We never mm -hmm. said anything that wasn't absolutely correct. I had such admiration for her. So um, coming back to the law school side, one thing you mentioned when you left LSU, sort of in your time in D.C., and then going on the market mm -hmm. with... Peter Shane, your, mm -hmm. your husband. So you're on the faculty together at a time when there's some amount of gender issues and contention. And so how did, you know, this, that it's an, un, it's maybe, um, it's not unique certainly, but the idea of having a, a, a legal academic family and sort of living through being at an institution with with, with that so dynamic. This is, this is my cut on it. Uh, I can interview Peter. <laughs> Peter was always behind me, the other women faculty, the progressive issues of the day, 100%. And boy, did he take a hit for it. Um, mm -hmm. That That's what I believe. That I think that um, there were opportunities for leadership. I mean, he had he was the um, uh, president of the faculty senate. Um, you know, kind of a, a, uh, certainly a leader in his own right. But within the law school, you know, he was not asked to chair the appointments committee. I was. You know, I mean, because you kind of sometimes have to have a woman after yeah, this, yeah. and that's when Adrian Wing was hired. So um, I think that in many ways, this is, it's tough. I think faculty couples are difficult. Peter and I did have a kind of style that we agreed upon. Not again, it was sort of we fell into it. We didn't sit together, we had different <laughs> names, we interviewed separately. There are many people that didn't know, you know, students that didn't know that we were a couple. We tried to have separate identities, and I think we were very mm -hmm. successful in doing that. Um, and it fit our kind of um, mode of being, but. The fact of the matter is that, you know, with respect to each other, we've been a team. Um, you know, my first article, I remember Peter read six drafts. <laughs> and uh, having the more elite education was able to tell me, you know, you don't use this word in quite this way. Um, and, you know, the 
the real sort of insider information that one needs, so mm -hmm. the mentorship was there. Um, and I like to think it went both ways. Uh, but during the Iowa years, because the spotlight was always on these, had been on these gender issues, I think that was, uh, you know, attention. Mm -hmm. So we left Iowa, and I was really ready to go. And it was not easy to get two jobs. So did you, you went out looking for it. I mean, you sort of agreed we, it was yes. the time. It was the time. We sent time. resumes out. You know, this was a time when you didn't like go on the market again mm -hmm. because by this time we were full professors. We were pretty senior. We were expensive, and we just like and two at once. Two at right. once. Yeah. Either at one institution yeah. or in the same city, at least. Right. Yeah. Yes. And um, and unlike when we were hired at Iowa, hiring had much slowed down by this time. Mm -hmm. Uh, there wasn't the boom years. So, um, so uh, Peter wondered whether he wanted to be a dean, and I very much encouraged him to do it because I thought, because I could take it out. So that's when we went to Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that he'd be a good dean, which I, you know. <laughs> It was tumultuous at Pittsburgh, yes, too. Yes, but, but, but that's, yeah, that's, but, yeah, that's the nature of academia. It was yeah, uh, yeah, tumultuous, yeah, yeah. yes. So, so Pittsburgh, because that's where he had a, an opportunity, an opportunity to, be dean. to be dean. Yeah. yeah. And you went on the faculty as well mm -hmm. at the same school. I did. So so what were those... So what before we moved to Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. is, is there anything about else about the arc of your experience at Iowa, the development of your scholarship, the development of your sensibilities, what you, evolution in your thinking about your, your, you know, your own directions. I mean, we may have covered it because we talked about the, the various things So I would say in. it was just such a time of tremendous growth during the Iowa years that it's hard for me even to piece together. But as mm -hmm. I sit with you, <laughs> Of course, what I remember was the great national networks of feminist mm -hmm. scholars that I think being at Iowa had put me on the radar uh, it, it, uh, screen. So I'm so glad you asked this question <laughs> because I remember getting a phone call from Sylvia Law who I thought walked on water, and of course she sort of does, does yes. in her own, yeah. you know, indomitable way, to say, would I be interested in running for the board of the Society of American Law Teachers? Because we don't have that many people from the Midwest, <laughs> and of course I'm moving from the Midwest, and I, you know, I think I had written just a couple of articles that were. Uh, gender related, and you know, I had been involved um, in gender related activities and knew about SALT but didn't know much about it. So I decided, yes, I would very much like to do this. And then that was just a, a time when, when I think about the people who were uh, active members on the SALT board at that time, they were really impressive group. And so, so this would have been. I, I don't want to stop the flow, but that's sort of timing. 80s. 80s and... So before you left Iowa... Well, no, that would have been, of course, 84 to 94. So while you were... It was so it was Iowa, and I don't know if it, okay. it, it was still at Pitt, I'm not sure. But okay. it was definitely okay. during Iowa, the end mm -hmm. of, you know, those years. Okay. So, um, so I got to know you, <laughs> and... Um, Gene and Pat, and many, many other. Mm -hmm. uh, Judith Resnick, Liz Schneider, mm -hmm. it, and on and on. And every single person that I got to know through SALT ended up by offering me something that was great. You know, come to speak. Uh, get involved with the National Women's Judges Association. 
um, you know, Sylvia sort of has been there helping me get jobs whenever I needed jobs. But um, just so many kinds of opportunities through this feminist, you know, I consider this a feminist progressive network mm -hmm. of, uh, of people. Okay, so now Pittsburgh. So what was Pittsburgh like? So Pittsburgh, I think we were there eight years or so. Um, Pittsburgh was very much a mixed bag. Um, I found some great uh, colleagues to connect with Debbie Bray and Lynn Wong, but it was more individuals. I held back a little because I was the spouse of a dean, realized early mm -hmm. on, oh, do not like this. Because it's amazing the number mm -hmm. of people who come in and complain about your husband to you. <laughs> a, I'm going to support him probably. B, what do you think, there's a conduit here? I mean, yeah. if that isn't, yeah. no. you know, and I, I have to say, it's just hard. You know, I, do, I realize it's gender inflected, but I don't even consider it necessarily, you know, mm -hmm. the same dimension. I think it might, you know, if there's a female dean, I think they'd be, so, right. you know. But it's the just path, not path to the powerful, right? Right, <laughs> path to the powerful, yeah. and uh, and I, I I found it unsettling. Um, I did use the time to do a lot of good writing. You know, I think in part, you know, kind of backing away a little from some of the activities and the service type things, and really spending time. Uh, so I I did write my treatise on. Feminist legal theory there. There were some of the, you know, I probably, when I look at my resume, probably did more important work in Pittsburgh because it was a, sort of a more mature kind of mm -hmm. scholarship. Um, Jody Armour, Lewin, and Debbie mm -hmm. Brink, I always had plenty of colleagues uh, to work with, but it was tense. And when Peter stepped down from the deanship again. I found myself okay. <laughs> Where are we going it's next? Time for, yeah. yeah, yeah. And you were so you were there for a, a, almost ten years. Um, eight, eight, eight years. Eight, years. eight, yeah. years, eight yeah. years. And then and then moved to OSU. But during the time before, mostly before going to OSU, some a little bit after, you visited. At a lot of different places, sometimes for a semester, sometimes for a, it maybe a a different kind of. I mean, some abroad as well as um, although some of those were more recent. So I'm wondering about about what that experience was like being in. And so were you? And were you? Were you? Did Peter come with you? And those. No. Okay, so okay, so there's the so, sort of being alone and also being in a new institution and new people and how that all. <laughs> so the visits. Yeah. So let's start with the visits. Although we had taken one visit when we were in Iowa, when we went to um, I was on sabbatical and Peter visited Duke, which was lovely in the kind of yep, thing yep. where we both went together. Uh, that was all fun, fun, fun. This was. Let's get out of pit. Mm -hmm. Let's see what the rest of the world was. So. Um, when things went south at Pitt, I called my friend Greg Williams, mm -hmm. uh, who mm -hmm. had become dean at Ohio State. Uh, we had been on the faculty for the whole time mm -hmm. at, at Iowa, and said, are you interested in a visitor? <laughs> and he said yes. So, um, so I first came to Ohio State, and I commuted from Pittsburgh mm -hmm. for three days a week. Um, that was not easy. Um, I drove. It's a three, mm -hmm. well, three hour plus drive. Um, there is a kind of um, disconnected feeling. I often forgot my belt or my <laughs> shoes or something. You know, the outfits right. weren't really put together. Um, but I really liked the Ohio State faculty. Um, there were a number of people on the Ohio State faculty that I knew from other places because mm -hmm. they had Ohio State had hired a lot laterally. Um, 
Uh, so I, I knew Ruth Coker. She had been mm -hmm. in Pitt. Uh, I knew Debbie Merritt from mm -hmm. just the old days and um, uh, interviewing uh, long-term friend Jim Brudney. So I always mm -hmm. think with the Ohio State, I remember thinking, I feel like I know these people, yeah. but they were all from different places. And so by this point, I was pretty senior. Um, and I, you know, it was a, it was a great visit. Um, and, but then I went back to Pitt. There wasn't, at that mm -hmm. point, I don't know, I think there was an opening at Ohio State. You know, I just sort of let it go there. And um, Peter visited at other places as well. He called his good friend Avi Soifer <laughs> at BC and said, how about a visit? So what we did is we, like, we, one would stay in Pittsburgh with our daughter and the other one would visit. So it's, it, was a, yeah. it was challenging. Uh, I remember Nancy Rogers organizing a, uh, a discussion group about work-family balance. She said, Martha, what do you think? And I said, I think we would Please forgive me, Beth, that when your daughter's 13, it's good to have your own apartment. <laughs> because that was that. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we did do that. Mm -hmm. um, and when, after the Michael Bortz gift, uh, Nancy Rogers called and said, would you like to be considered for the, uh, a chair at Ohio State? And I said, oh, yes. Um, and then uh, Peter by that point was at Carnegie Mellon in the public policy school. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it took a year before Peter's uh, position was available at Ohio State. So so you started at Ohio State a year before. before, a year yeah. before. So, yeah. so I, and I, I think it's really interesting with the dual career couples. I remember people saying, you and Peter could go anywhere. And I thought, <laughs> yes, you think that, don't yeah, you? Yeah. But that's not the way it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were, you know, really fortunate um, to get the jobs at Ohio State. Did you, um, in the various visits, did I... I think it's hard in a semester visit to engage fully with a faculty. You don't go to faculty meetings. I mean, it's one of the benefits of a visit is you don't have to do those sorts of things. But, but did you, did you make connections? I'm thinking about about with women faculty particularly, or seeing differences from school to school in ways that informed your understanding of so legal academia. So much so, because so once you get the visit thing down you realize, particularly if it's only a semester, you can't wait for people to ask you out to lunch or dinner because by the time they realize they really want to do it, it's at the end of the semester. Yeah. So what you have to do is front load that stuff. Yeah. And uh, so I have visited for a variety of different reasons at different times, you know, at uh, First Ohio State, uh, Suffolk, Washington University, mm -hmm. and Virgin in, in Richmond. Not and, to mention in ten Tennessee. That was more of a uh, okay. Uh, that, that was, was a, more of the programmatic uh, kind of gig where you go for a few days for three for three months. Okay, okay. So yep, even yep. though that was <laughs> okay. called it was a, a visitorship, yeah, yeah. it was more of a drop right. in for these intensive. Yeah. Okay. It was great, great program, but more of but a different. Program. Yeah, yeah. Not a semester, right. and you're teaching the students. Uh, so I did, um, at each place, uh, usually make a fast friend or uh, a few fast friends with individuals, many of whom I had known before. So uh, it was easier at Ohio State. Um, but at Washington University, Susan Appleton mm -hmm. um, and and other visitors at that time. We had a great cadre of people um, um, at Richmond, um, uh, Mary Heen, um, and Anne, and, uh, and, and at Suffolk, uh, Frank Cooper. Mm -hmm. And it was just, so and what I tended to do was sort of look down the faculty list and think about who would be a kindred spirit and call them up early and say, can oh. we have lunch? And then 
Um, as often happens, you know, people uh, are very generous mm -hmm. uh, with their time, and sometimes they, you know, like having somebody new. So I felt like at most of these faculties that I had at least um, a, a much better experience than many visitors do who um, are pretty isolated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you and took the initiative, and and also you were alone, but for yes. most of these, so you didn't have the family going home to the family in the evening. Yes, so, um. and and uh, and I do think that because I was kind of like the house guest. In, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I I don't know how many times I went to Susan Appleton's house. Yeah. You know, I, I felt like I could just go over there. You know, um, and that that was the. Mm -hmm. You know, it's different in each place, but you're sort of available. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and sort of more willing to do it, too, mm -hmm. because... You're right, you're not, yeah. you're not matching schedules, who's coming home when, and... Right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, uh, so in terms of what did I learn about the different institutions, a couple, couple of things. One thing was, I was always struck by the similarities of law school. You know, even though law schools have their distinctive cultures, um, the similarities are often great, particularly in terms of the classroom. You know, because I worried, what I, you know, how could I um, uh, relate to these various different groups of students? And I found ah, students are students. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, that that there was a lot that was transferable. Um, I found that some schools were so much more intellectually live, livelier than other schools. You, know, you could see sort of how much was going on. So I thought that that was a difference. Um, I do think with respect to the visits, you hear from f women faculty, you hear from others about the political climate of the school but I didn't have that insider sense. So, you know, there were some schools that were much more sedate and seemed like they weren't doing that much with respect to gender equality and other schools that were very mm -hmm. much, uh, very much different. Later, um, at Ohio State, I visited at Harvard, mm -hmm. and that was sort of the biggest difference that I saw uh, in the schools that I had visited. But, um, and that, that they were, well, talk about that. <laughs> well, I'll talk about that. Um, it was much more intense, mm -hmm. much more intense. And, you know, I expected the students to be smart, but, oh! And mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was a great experience. And uh, in partly because the, because the students were so motivated and so not only wanting to learn every bit of doctrine you could throw their way or, you know, uh, other aspects of sort of the body of tort law or mm -hmm. employment discrimination law, uh, but the but there were just so many student groups. It's a big place, and when you think mm -hmm. about it, everyone is being, having a real sense of wanting this to be a, a unique experience for themselves. Um, there were so many requests and opportunities I had to speak to about gender and tort law, to speak about women in the classroom, to speak about um, feminist theory. And that, that was primarily student-driven. So mm -hmm. what I realized, um, although I did get to know some faculty members and had it had a nice little cadre of visitors in our floor, or sort of like the visitor's floor, um, that I found myself much more enmeshed in the lives of the students than I had been sometimes at other schools, because they were just, there were more of them, they, and they were more active, and they had a lot more money to deal with. No. You know, they had their organizations were well-funded. And, and they made a for to, a particular in infusing of yes theory. like our yeah. section had a budget that was bigger than the women's studies budget in <laughs> Iowa yeah. and uh, you know the tort section so yeah. when they decided they wanted to do something they mm -hmm. 
they just were able to do it. So uh, I do, that's the one theme I will have is whenever there's been big pots of money, there's more activity yeah. associated with yeah. these groups. So, um, so two di very different questions. Mm -hmm. I'll do them one at a time. You, you mentioned your daughter um, having, and now she's well past 13. That was a moment in that. But, but um, how was, what, what impact do you think it had on her about having two law faculty parents and a, and a strong, well, both a strong woman, law-focused mother and a very supportive law-focused I, I, and, and, and busy people, you know, sharing parenting in a, even in a particularly stressful way when you go away for a semester. Yeah. Um, well, I think it had an enormous impact. Um, one impact was for a lot of her life, her whole life, was the university. You know, when you think about having both parents' offices mm -hmm. be in the university. One time we went on vacation and uh, she wanted to know where our offices were, you know. <laughs> she, she always felt that they... And when I had an, another office at Women's Studies, Beth was very upset that Peter didn't have two offices. <laughs> was very egalitarian at that moment. Um, so, and I remember as a young child, she would come to the feminist reading group and she would get the cookies ready, and she got all the things. And she was just, she loved that. She just loved it. Um, and so, and Iowa City was her place. Um, so she grew up, and she, I thought she would never want to be a lawyer in particular. She just never showed any um, inclinations that way. And I didn't know what, I thought she might be do She's very sort of creative. I thought she might do something and you know that had a kind of arts edge to it. And when she went to college, she uh, got to be a very serious student and decided she wanted to get her PhD and went back to the University of Iowa to get her PhD in English. And I thought, oh, back to the homestead. <laughs> I have to. I actually had some mixed feelings about it because by that time we had gone. And but I loved her dissertation chair. She had been in women's studies, so Beth pretty much followed the path um, uh, and continues to do so. Um, there weren't, there was no jobs in Victorian literature. I mean, zero. And she uh, had a, a VAP in Iowa and looked for so long, and it was coming increasingly clear that it like mm -hmm. likely the academic uh, uh, English academic job was not going to happened for Beth, at least not for a very long time. And so she uh, went back to New York City with a partner and worked for a couple of years and then said, to our utter surprise, I think I'll go to law school. Oh. <laughs> so she's the third year at NYU. Oh. And uh, so in, in so many ways, sort of interdisciplinary piece, I think that she um, she knows so much more than I do yeah. he, uh, because of her intensive work. So she's still very much the academic at heart, I think, uh, but will probably practice law at least for a time. <laughs> um, I think it was a great life for her in some ways. In other ways, I think about it, um, wow, what a, it's, it's difficult for somebody to forge their own path. Mm -hmm. And um, and and it, it it was I don't know, I think it wasn't easy for Beth I think there were times particularly in high school when she was not happy and kind of tired of the all the uh, emotions surrounding the parents and the parents' mm -hmm. jobs <laughs> because there was a lot of it as you can imagine well and a lot of it's your your in your having the same, being at the same institution most of the time, mm -hmm. then you bring, yeah, you bring it home more specifically even <laughs> than, yes. than if you have jobs in different places and you may talk about the jobs, but it's a, it's a yes. different kind and, of And having, a, you know, being able to, to have a good perspective on it and keep things at a distance, never my strong suit. <laughs>
gotten better at it, but um, so Beth had to shoulder a lot of that. Yeah. Um, so I do wonder, I do wonder, I wonder, you know, does having a feminist mother really provide you that strength for you to have your own career, or is it just like you really <laughs> <laughs> had to deal with her right, problems right. too? So I, I was, I was going to ask you, I don't know if this is a fruitful avenue, um, looking at the things you teach now, most of them are, you know, it's employment discrimination, employment law, feminist legal theory, gender in the law, um, workplace bias, and torts. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder, but you already mentioned that you, your perspective on torts may be different because of all the rest of the work. Oh, yes, and this is, in, in terms of, um, uh, so my perspective on torts is um, pretty distinctive in that I've spent probably the most time in terms of a scholar looking at tort law through uh, gender and race lens. And I think if you asked those people who might know my name, that's what they know my name mm -hmm. for, sort of gender and tort law, feminist mm -hmm. uh, tort law. And, um, and this was um, a direct outgrowth from my collaboration with Linda Kerber. So um, I taught torts and loved it because I loved teaching first year students. Um, but, you know, sort of didn't think of myself as having a civil rights orientation to torts, although at the same time I was beginning to teach mm -hmm. these courses in Title VII and other gender related courses. Um, but I realized that um, there were certain aspects of tort law that I spent a lot more time on than my colleagues. Um, emotional distress cases uh, being a big example. Um, and particularly when we started paring down towards from five hours to four hours. And, um, I didn't want to get rid of these courses, mm -hmm. these cases, so I started thinking, well, you know, what's the significance of these cases? And I did realize early on that there were female plaintiffs, they were often pregnant, the kind of gender-saturated uh, rationales for denying recovery, particularly in the earlier cases, but the cause of action still seemed to be marginalized, and I wanted to know just what was going on, and that's when I did approach Linda. And I said, I've got this idea for us looking at the history of these fright cases, mm -hmm. these cases where uh, plaintiffs say that fright caused them um, some kind of miscarriage or stillbirth, you know, these early canonical cases that were called mental distress cases, but really were reproductive interest cases, mm -hmm. particularly when the harms were stillbirths and uh, miscarriages. So, um, so that's where we started our collaboration, and we did sort of um, look at the history of these fright cases in different periods in U.S. history and um, um, and produced an article. Um, and then I realized, oh, this isn't just the fright cases. Mm -hmm. I could investigate many other areas of tort law, vicarious liability, intentional tort law, uh, theorize about the various kinds of biases um, in tort law, and and so I've I've spent a good deal of my career um, writing about these issues, and writing about and and then bringing it into the classroom, I assume too. Yes. So I wonder about impact on women students through. A variety of ways, I and mean, it could be just you know the other classes you teach as well, feminist theory, and who takes those. But even in the first year torts classroom. So I think I think, um, I, and I still struggle with this. You know how much, and I would as I as we speak, I'm thinking of all the kinds of salt inspired, you know, mainstreaming gender and race in the mm -hmm. uh, first year courses 
the conferences that were held. Um, so I, I try early on to bring a kind of gender perspective and race perspective to the materials that we use. I still tend to teach a pretty traditional course. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I'm not doing it nearly enough. Um, you know, this year, for example, and I'll, I'll, I'll pick out different areas. Like this year, I um, had our students, uh, had my students read a really great article by a young scholar, Sarah Swan, about the bystander rule and I mean, the no, uh, no duty to rescue rule that finds uh, no liability in tort law. And she talked about in this article about all the bystander intervention programs we have now to fight uh, sexual harassment and campus rape and the disconnect mm -hmm. between um, those two um, uh, orientations to bystander responsibility. And that was like a great opportunity to talk about sexual harassment. And, and so, uh, but some years I'll pick out something else to do. And I think I do very little, except that the students pick up on it so quickly yeah. that immediately, it, you know, I can tell you that will be the day when somebody will shoot down to me and say, do you do more writing on this? Because this is what I really want to yeah. yeah. do. And so uh, this past summer, um, I finally, because uh, I hadn't actually taught a course called Gender, Race, and Tort Law, I did so at Tel Aviv University mm. to an amazingly mm. uh, international group. Um, and it was, it was sort of fun to put it all together in mm -hmm. a course. And uh, we have kind of changed up our curriculum at Ohio State. We're going to have these perspective uh, one hour, two hour courses in the first year, and I think I will bring that in. Yeah, yeah, I will have yeah. that offering for people to sign up if they're they're interested. Mm -hmm. So, um, thinking back, so I, I I might have asked a general question about advice to women academics, new um, new women academics, but. But I, I want to ask you particularly about back in 2005, so it's now been, what, five, what over, over 10 years, you wrote an article called The Shadow of Professor <laughs> Kingsfield, <laughs> Contemporary Dilemmas Facing Women Law Professors. And I, I, um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what you, because that was a message there, I think, about what women, um, women law professors Faced and faced then, faced before then, and up till that time, and then, and then, you know, building from that after, if things have changed. But sort of, what did you, what did you write about that? What kind of dilemmas were you talking about? Well, um, so I chose Kingsfield <laughs> because uh, I still think he's around, um, in the sense that for many. Um, women law professors, it's somewhat hard to find the right um, way to present themselves in the classroom. Because um, I still think that, and this, this has come from talking with a number of my younger colleagues now, and now they're all younger <laughs> colleagues. Um, who I know to be um, engaging and vibrant, and yet when it comes to the reception, at least of some students in the classroom, there's a presumption of, if not incompetence, a kind of we have to wait and see where someone, mm -hmm. a more Kingsfieldian type, um, is able to have a presumption of competence. So that's this idea of you know still kind of not there yet. Um, so I I talked about salary uh, because there's still amazing salary discrepancies between men and women in the 
academy. Um, I think we're going to find in this Me Too moment that there's a lot of sexual harassment stories that mm -hmm. have not been spoken because of concerns with a professional advancement. Um, and then, particularly, I think, with respect to um, so many women now who come into the academy, bring this an intersectional identity, uh, where they're both their race or ethnicity is salient, salient as well as their gender, um, and the dynamics of interviewing and, and uh, the selection process is still very, very fraught um, for women. So um, I wrote this um, essay for um, the William, the uh, Women's Law Society mm -hmm. at William and Mary, when they were sort of reflecting on women after, you know, some kind of an anniversary. Um, so uh, I think my message there was um, there is a kind of reproduction of inequality that occurs. It's not all a straight line mm -hmm. kind of arc to progress. Although there have been dramatic changes. There are certainly more women faculty. There are many, many more women deans. And there are many more, more women of color. There are large numbers of law students. And I think that feminism is pretty established, even if marginal. You know, I always say established, but, but marginal. marginal. Um, but better than no, not, you know, yeah, no yeah. structures. There are feminist law journals. I mean, you can do fine mm -hmm. by using these uh, these uh, these supportive structures. Um, but I do think there, at least until last year with Me Too, there was a, a sense by a number of faculty members that the gender thing was all over in law schools. Mm -hmm. Um, and instead, not so much, because particularly with the requiring PhDs or these other kinds of hurdles, we, we, we've kind of, again, plateaued, as I, um, Derek Bell always called it, a kind of containment, mm -hmm. where you look at faculties and, oh, like we're about a third here, and that's sort of what it is in a lot of places. Congress may be at 22 percent, Senate maybe 22 percent mm -hmm. now, but come on. Right. We're supposed right. to be at somewhat at parity, and it still matters. It's not just the numbers. It's that there's still this concern. Do we have enough women in the first year classes? You know, we want you to teach this so we can, you know, I, I heard, well, we want so-and-so to teach so we have a woman in the first year class. And I thought, yes, that's important, and I'm so tired of hearing it. Mm -hmm. I'm so tired of having to schedule with, with gender in mind. Um, you know, we really ought to be at a point where it doesn't, we don't have to take that into account, but we're nowhere near it. And, and particularly with respect to the dramatically no, low representations of African Americans, Hispanics, and some other minorities, it's... it's right. The diversity within and the intersectionality yes. makes it real. Yeah. So, you know, very much a work in progress. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about the, the arc of your career. Yes. We haven't talked... We, we, I guess we didn't talk a lot about OSU, but you did in inter, you know. I have to say a few things. Okay, say a few I, things. There are a few <laughs> things, but then I'll kind of let you go because, yeah. um, so uh, it's funny because Joshua Dressler, who is also a lateral hire here, has the same speech. So we have our speech <laughs> done, but, very, but the very quick speech is um, OSU has been different. It's been so much more receptive mm -hmm. to me. Um, I feel like I breathe every day I come to work, and I don't take the back stairs so I can avoid various people. And uh, it, it, you know, and it's been so long since I've had to, I've had to do that that I don't remember really doing that. Um, I, I have felt like when I wanted to be heard, I was heard. Um, you know, you don't always get what you want, mm -hmm. but, uh, and I think partly it's because 
uh, there was a longer tradition of gender leadership. You know, Nancy Rogers, Debbie Merritt, Rose Colker, on and on and on mm -hmm. uh, of women who had made a career made a career here and were highly respected and very much inside. So um, it's a little bit more of the fabric of the institution, not yeah. not a battle. Yeah, no, uh, to establish. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, we, every faculty has its contentious battles. And I have to, you know, just trying to be self-reflective. It's a whole lot different when you arrive at a place and um, someone has recruited you because of your work and in a shared position and there's not any asterisk mm -hmm. associated with it. Oh, you can come, but we're not giving you tenure. Or, oh, you can come, but you'll only be the second woman there. You know, so I, and, and so there's, there are gender equality issues present in the, in the law school. We're currently um, uh, trying to think about the status of our clinical and legal writing faculty, and it's very, um, uh, a very hurtful kind of discussion for many members of the faculty. And I realize, oh, I'm not, you know, I don't feel it. So I've kind of mm -hmm. uh, crossed over in that sense. But it's nice because um, there was a time, and this is what Joshua and I said, where we thought every time we go to a faculty, we're going to be looking to get the hell out. <laughs> but we don't at all feel that way. Oh, so, no. you know, kind of um, uh, good, good place, good time. And how does that, does that play out in your productivity or, I mean, it's, it's been a long time coming to get to that space. So, um, so I think, first of all, it has allowed me to continue to teach. I'm 68 now and uh, not want to leave immediately. So it's allowed longevity. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's interesting about the productivity, you know, sometimes the adversity kind yeah, of yeah. makes you publish more than you would, or maybe it's at a different time. So, you know, I wouldn't say, oh, I'm a more, mm -hmm. more productive person. I'm just a happier person, <laughs> and I'm likely to last longer. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and that makes a, uh, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And I've um, well, chaired the appointments committee a bunch of times here. Um, we've hired a lot of people. It just, you know, I just feel like it's my school. Mm -hmm. And I do say that <laughs> about the other schools. No, no. Yeah. Well, that's a great place to yeah. be yeah. at, at yeah. this so, stage. So, yeah. so anything, anything else that you'd... I, I think I've run out of questions. Yes, <laughs> um, but, you've, but been like so, what, you've been so comprehensive. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure there are things. But the, the one other thing that I think I mentioned before... And, and I, you know, I think about younger generations um, of law faculty and students as well. Uh, so every step along the way, I have had these great women networks, you know, whether mm -hmm. it was those 20 at LSU, um, students together, or SALT, or um, the various people that I tended to connect with in the visits, um, and that was that's always been sustaining, and and it sustains sort of through the generations. So um, the younger faculty members that I am most close to are supposedly the ones I mentored, and I always laugh about that because the ones I mentored, I'm calling and saying. Did you write an exam this semester? Could you send that to me so I could take a look at what you're doing? You know, the mentorship it, has, right, you know, it goes, it, yeah, it's yes, really it uh, around. It's, yes. it's actually <laughs> lopsided yes. at this point. The mentees are providing the no. sustenance, but but just in so so many mm -hmm. um, uh, individuals, and and they have been men as well. 
uh, but mostly women. And uh, even in terms of the publishers of my books, the editors of my books, you know, and um, so I just think I just live in that world mm -hmm. and have been happy to do so and, and feel supported. And, uh, and I think this is what feminists talk about when they talk about agency and, and collaboration and coalition. Um, so what, every year when I teach gender in the law, something like this, and I say, somebody who I've never met or something, says, oh, what are you teaching? I say, oh, I'm doing a seminar on gender in the law, feminist theory. And they say, how many men are in that class? Mm -hmm. And I think this year, this <laughs> semester, I've had several great guys, but this semester I think it's zero. And, you know, I finally told off somebody that asked me that question, and I said, you know, the implication is somehow, and I think they want to know, are you just, are you reaching the mm -hmm. men? And I've never thought that that was a problem. I've always thought that the kind of intensive intellectual experience, particularly interrogating issues of gender, race, and other, um, can be done very productively in an all-female space. Um, it can also be done very well in an integrated space. But this idea, <laughs> yeah, this I, it, and and I think this is. For me, sometimes the best discussions are not the discussions where it's point counterpoint, although those can be good, mm -hmm. but where you're kind of drilling down deeply. You're saying you're asking why, and even if you're you're just finding more support for um, an argument, and you're able to do so because there are a lot of people who have the same perception, mm -hmm. but they have slightly different takes on it, or hey, what about all the differences among women? Right. And right. it becomes so apparent, because even when you have an all-female class, there can be uh, race, sexual orientation, pro-choice, anti-choice, uh, ideology, so many differences. Well, and class. And class, Which, yes. I mean, and we, didn't, we didn't go back to, to that piece yeah. about how your, your beginnings, because is one of the things that I've ended up with some conversations mm -hmm. with among students, students coming from a working class or lower class background sometimes feel the most excluded and the most Absolutely. different yeah. because of the privilege that, that, that it, it has, that many of the students have in, in that way at least. So how, going back to those parts of your roots, how has that I, so, you know, so much, I would <laughs> say, and, and you're so astute, um, so I think, what was, what was the legacy of being the town? Mm -hmm. um, and that is, it was a little hard to find my voice, and I mean literally find mm -hmm. my voice. It took me a year to be able to speak up in the LSU faculty meetings. I mean, I was, and, and I was fine in the classroom. You know, somehow you can play that sort of role and you're, 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 mm -hmm. you're anointed, you're the teacher, there's the desk, you're gonna grade them, you know, this, people can perform roles. But the idea of being able to speak in this room full of law professors, you know, and I, I might have thought I'm the only woman, but it wasn't that. It was the kid from Watertown that I think was having the harder time speaking. And literally, I would have to take deep breaths and uh, just to say much. And although one-on-one um, -on -one was easy, it was still hard mm -hmm. in the kind of, uh, now that I see it, the more formal roles where I think people from more privileged backgrounds I used to giving little speeches at weddings, or they give speeches and, you know, they just, that's part of the repertoire mm -hmm. of learning how to be with people, yeah, yeah. and not so much right. for me. So um, that came gradually, and I think 
um, that being concerned if someone thought, uh, you know, the sort of imposter mm -hmm. syndrome. I'm fine in this environment, but if I have to teach you know, at Harvard, they'll, they'll find me out, you know, they'll find me out, and that that kind of almost never leaves. Mm -hmm. And I can see where, um, particularly at a time where there is so much more racial and gender diversity, how the class, the still invisible class mm -hmm. uh, dimension plays a big role. Yeah. Yeah. So anything else you, that I haven't asked about that? I don't think so. <laughs> cause, um, and, uh, but as always, it's so, it's so nice <laughs> to talk with you. And the years just kind of melt away. Thank you. Yeah, it's just like a softboard meeting. Right. So. Um, Thanks so much, girl. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah.